I'm uh, honored to have been asked by the Historical Society to introduce my father tonight. Um, I imagine many people who, who know me would find it surprising that I'd be speaking in a LDS facility. Um, it's a new experience for me, and it's a beautiful building. And again, I thank, thank the LDS folks for letting us use it tonight. I was born in Los Alamos the year they, they took the fence down. And I grew up among the people who stayed on after the Manhattan Project, and many who joined them from all over the world over the next 20 <coughs> years to create a community out of the shadow and the ruins of that great historic event. My father was one of those people who helped build this town, basically from scratch, as a community with arts, government, learning for kids, and a sense of its natural environment. Many of the other people who built this community from the edge of the Albert, uh, laboratory's fence in an atmosphere of um, science, secrecy, relevance to a larger world are here with us tonight, and many more of them have also passed on, of course. Though the Manhattan Project was an amazing feat, the development of a community in its aftermath in this remote place, in the mix of cultures and histories in this region, in these fire-prone mountains, in the shadow of the laboratory with its large mission, is a story of American perseverance and creativity in itself. And nothing as important as atomic weapons and the people who developed them could be simple or without conflict and controversy. In Los Alamos, I think it's easy to take a somewhat simplified view of the atomic bomb and its importance to the war. Yet beneath the surface of the Manhattan Project lay conflict and suspicion that flared into a larger national stage after the war, as my father will discuss tonight. The intense disagreement over what our nation and the world should do with nuclear weapons technology after the war is the undercurrent of the Oppenheimer trials. And this is the topic that has entered the news for five decades. The culture of secrecy and the prominence of, of the weapons mission at Los Alamos made some kinds of dissent and protest difficult and even unlikely. My father engaged in an act of conscience and dissent in 1954, as he will discuss. His action was not without risk, but it was essential for the con continuity of the scientific culture that developed at, at Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory during the Manhattan Project and in the three decades that followed it. The deeply American act of disagreeing and developing consensus around matters of conscience is at the core of who we are as a people. I admire, I admire my father a great deal for, for taking just such an act that he will describe in its larger context tonight. It's easy for me to see where my father naturally made the connection between his science and the larger world. I saw this plainly growing up. He and my mother created a family where current affairs were the main topic of conversation at almost every dinner table, where we were all encouraged to develop our views clearly as we ate our pork chops and those Texas grits. <laughs> Beyond that, we were encouraged to get involved with the larger community and both my parents led by a strong example in this realm. My father was born in, born in, my father was born in Laredo, <coughs> Texas, August 14, 1924, to parents who were descendants of German and English Scottish immigrants were making a life for their family in both Old Mexico and Texas. He grew up in San Antonio, Texas. His parents, Viola and Otto, taught him and his two brothers to work hard and to play hard, and my grandfather Otto's love of the outdoors was passed easily to my father, and ultimately contributed to his decision to come to Los Alamos and its beautiful environment years later. Fred got his Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and Physics at the University of Texas in 1944. <coughs> his Master's of Science in Physics at the University of Chicago in 1950 and his PhD in Physics at the University of Chicago in 1951. He joined the Navy in 1944 and was assigned to a unit responsible for electronics, communications, and intelligence in Washington, D.C., where, where he met my mother, Mally, and was married in 1946. 
Fred came to Los Alamos in 1951 as a staff physicist, working first in P4 doing neutron research broadly, broadly related to the H-bomb. His first office was in the Z building near Ashley Pond Pond. He was involved in measuring uh, the mic test at Bikini Atoll. He then moved on to P15 under the great uh, Jim Tuck, leaving weapons work behind and devoted the rest of his career to fusion research. First with the Sher Sherwood project, then a series of magnetic con containment fusion projects, culminating in the huge SILOC theta pinch experiment. He worked his way from group leader to division leader for the Controlled Thermonuclear Research Division, CTR, where he was uh, division leader from 1974 to 1977 at which point the nation cons consolidated its magnetic containment fusion research elsewhere. He then moved to the University of Washington in Seattle, where he was professor of nuclear engineering from 1977 to 1989, and was the editor of the Physics of Fluid Journal during that time. His awards, affiliations, and appointments are too numerous to mention completely. Most notably, he was a delegate to the Second International Conference on the Peaceful Uses of Atomic Energy, a Guggenheim Fellow at the Max Planck Institute in 1964, Chairman of the U.S. Department of Energy Magnetic Fusion Advisory Committee from 1984 to 1989, <coughs> received the Lifetime Achievement Award and Distinguished Career Award from the Fusion Power Associates. He was a member of the U.S.-USSR Joint Fusion Power Coordinating Committee, Chairman of the Division of Plasma Physics at the American Physical Society and a fellow of both the American Physical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He was also an adjunct professor of physics at the University of Texas from 1974 to 1977. Even with all this, I think Fred's greatest pride is his family, his four sons, four grandchildren, his distinguished daughters-in-law, including Monique, who is here with us tonight, and his wonderful wife, Marjorie, who also joined us. Ladies and gentlemen, my father, Dr. Fred L. Reed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom, for that wonderful introduction. And again, thank the LDS Church for having us and the wonderful facilities they've given us for this lecture. We can't, most people can't hear us. Can you hear? No. no. You can't hear you. Guys, speak closer. Oh, I have to speak closer. Okay. Thank Tom for the introduction, the LDS Church, for the facilities. And uh, I'm now going to give my talk on the events of the spring and summer of 1954. At that time, I was 30 years old, having, as Tom said, come to the laboratory in 1951 and uh, worked for, for Jim Kuhn. Jerry Kellogg was our division leader. Diz Graves, Elizabeth Graves, was uh, a close associate closest so in those days working on neutron cross sections, uh, largely uh, lithium, both isotopes and things like that. I worked with Louis and so many people. It was a great pleasure, one of the great pleasures of my life and the most, one of the most fun things of my life to do that. So along in 1954, the laboratory, and in fact the whole country, became engrossed in the Oppenheimer proceedings. And I will go through this in detail, that's the object of this lecture, to describe what went on and also what the laboratory's reaction to it was. So I'll now uh, proceed, and let's see, Tom, you can advance the slides. And we may as well go to the next one. Okay. It, the proceedings 
the security proceedings were called in the matter of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Next. And here's an outline of my talk. First of all, the background. The AEC charges against Oppenheimer. The Gray Commission hearings, this was the security board. The AEC findings following that the Los Alamos laboratory response, and then afterward, things that happened. Okay, here's Oppenheimer, wartime Los Alamos leader. He and General Groves led the Manhattan bomb project that developed the first nuclear fission weapons between 1943 and 45. Picture of Oppenheimer and Groves at the Trinity site, site of the first uh, implosion type fission weapon with a plutonium core that was successfully tested here. Uh, in going from 45 to 54, I'll just mention the, uh, the main nuclear devices. There is a Trinity fission device in July 15, 45, the Hiroshima fission device. August 6, 45, the Nagasaki fission device. August 9, 45, then jumping up to the fusion devices, thermonuclear devices, hydrogen devices. The Mike liquid fusion device in October 30th, 52. And uh, I skip on, skip on to the Castle series of tests, the Bravo solid fusion device. Thank you. In uh, March of 1954. Um, these here, the Hearings and, and indeed the attitudes of people to Oppenheimer and the, and the country generally had to do with the hydrogen fusion bomb concept. And so we have to just briefly, in a glancing matter, uh, manner, discuss the fusion, the uh, hydrogen bomb concepts. There is the super, which uh, came out under the aegis largely of Edward Teller, and of course the Los Alamos Laboratory, where, it, where in a fission primary ignites fusion reactions in a fusion secondary. That is to say a secondary consisting of heavy hydrogen isotopes, deuterium and tritium, and later those as combined with lithium to make a solid core. Then the later, now that was the super concept. The later, later came the teller Ulam concept in which the radiation from the fission primary is used to promote a fusion explosion, the so-called radiation implosion, which is now a well-known open concept. Oppenheimer and working bomb scientists concluded that the super would not work. And Oppenheimer and bomb scientists recognized that the Taylor Ulam design would work, and it was the basis for all subsequent H-bombs. Contro there was, now of course, if the controversy over hydrogen bomb development, which uh, Oppenheimer, of course, was strongly inv involved in, he had left Los Alamos early on, shortly after 5045, to become director of the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. But he remained a very public figure and an advisor to the government. He occupied 
positions like chairman of the General Advisory Committee to the Atomic Energy Commission and so forth, many other advisory committee uh, positions. Now, a controversy developed over the development of the H-bomb, which began with the super concept. Enthusiasts on one side urged all-out development, while others, including Oppenheimer, urged caution. The argument was clouded by the fact that the discovery of the Teller-Ulam principle occurred after the controversy on development had begun. The controversy began when we only had the super concept before the Teller-Ulam uh, co-discovery. But, and it, I think Beta in his, in his books and talk, Hans Beta, mentioned that it was somewhat confusing because what started out as an argument over how fast to build on a concept which was not practicable became an argument on how to proceed with lots of bombs based on the principle, namely the radiation implosion principle, which would work. Very, it's very interesting, and I remember being impressed by that uh, during the controversy next. So <coughs> Oppenheimer uh, developed a number of enemies, and uh, I shouldn't say enemies, enemies in the sense that they took a uh, d entirely different position than he did about how fast to build the bomb and what used to make of it uh, afterward. So in 1953, that's December, about six months, five months before the events I'm going to describe, President Dwight Eisenhower ordered a blank wall between Oppenheimer and government nuclear secret. From then on, he had no access to, uh, to nuclear knowledge or what was going on at the various laboratories. Um, this Herblock cartoon from the Washington Post shows Eisenhower and Straws, Admiral Straws, um, having built this wall and Oppenheimer and uh, he says who's being walled off from what on okay next slide so having uh, had his uh, access to government classified information removed Oppenheimer was informed of this by Chairman Straws, chairman of the AEC, and was asked uh, if he wanted to quietly, quietly simply accept this. He was only a consultant to the government at that point. Uh, and Oppenheimer uh, chose to contest the withdrawal of his clearance, which really meant the end of his uh, public life in as a consultant on uh, defense and nuclear matters. So there resulted a letter of charges from the AEC, by the AEC, and the charges uh, cover a lot of paper, but in essence, uh, these bullets show what they were Communist associations in the 30s and 40s when Oppenheimer was a professor at, in Berkeley and uh, in Caltech at the same time. Um, he was, uh, like many of uh, people in those days, um, he had left-wing views. He had communist sympathies, although he's never a member although he had a girlfriend uh, who was a communist and his brother, in fact, joined the party, Frank. Uh, so the 30s and 40s, um, during, the, during the war when Oppenheimer was here, he was under 
constant surveillance by army intelligence, later by the FBI. And uh, whenever he went back to Berkeley or wherever he went, uh, his movements were followed. Um, and General Groves, a uh, three-star general at that time, the man who built the Pentagon, um, was quite aware of all these things. He was continuously briefed by, by the uh, intelligence people on their misgivings about Oppenheimer's background. And, uh, but he, he became, he was always aware of that, but he stood by Oppenheimer and basically because he needed the man to build the bomb. Oppenheimer was the one American scientist who in his training went over to Europe. He got his PhD in, at the University of Göttingen uh, under Max Born. Uh, and uh, so he learned quantum mechanics there and, uh, and what nuclear physics there was to learn in those days and came back to this country as the one eminent American physicist who knew European physics. And of course, so much of the developments in Europe, the Fermi, the greatest discovery of fission, et cetera, et cetera, were, uh, were done, well, of course, done by Europeans. And uh, Oppenheimer was good friends with many of these people who later after Hitler emigrated to this country to take up their work here and many of them, some of them came to Los Alamos. There was an incident, the Chevalier Eltonton affair, which uh, had to do with a professor of Romance languages named Hakon Chevalier, who reported to Oppenheimer sort of casually that a man named Eltonton uh, had connections to the Russian embassy. And, and this was in 43 during the development. And, uh, and uh, wondered if anything could be done. Oppenheimer immediately said, uh, no, that would be treason to think of, it, of passing information. And uh, he <coughs> neglected to, to go past that other than to report that the Eltonton incident had occurred without saying that out of a sense of friendship and chivalry perhaps, who, that it was Chevalier, his professor friend at Berkeley, who had uh, mentioned Eltonton. And after that, uh, when he was questioned about it by the security officials to try to draw him out, he equivocated. And uh, they finally had to sort of drag it out of him. So that was that incident. And then the other charges by the AEC that were that he opposed and delayed the development of the H-bomb in a sort of a blanket sense. Next slide. So the AEC called a security board. Uh, it should have been an ordinary security board in which both, in which uh, the whole man is looked at and, uh, and, but in turn, in fact, it turned into an adversar adversarial matter. So the, um, the chairman was a Democrat, Gordon, at this point, Eisenhower was president. Um, Gordon Gray, who, who had been president of uh, University of North Carolina, assistant secretary of the army and 
director of Psych psychological strategy board and so forth. He had good antecedents. And uh, next slide. Uh, the security board also had on it Ward Evans. He was known to be a, he had been on many security boards. He, uh, he was considered a sort of a hanging type guy on a security board who really went after people on, at security hearings. Uh, at the point, at that point he was the department head of chemistry at uh, Northwestern University. Next slide. Um, Thomas Morgan was a member. He was a retired president and board chairman of the Sperry Corp. Next slide. The defense, I call it defense attorney. They weren't called defense attorneys, but they were in fact that, <coughs> since it turned out to be adversarial. Uh, Oppenheimer had looked around a while to find someone who would take his defense. He ended up with uh, Lloyd P. Garrison, senior partner in a New York law firm, descendant of the abolitionist William Garrison, board member of the ACLU, later dean of uh, Wisconsin Law School. Next slide. The prosecutor, I call him that, um, was Roger Robb, who had been a U.S. District Attorney prior and tried a number of uh, very successful cases defending, uh, uh, prosecuting various things I won't go into. He's later a uh, U.S. Court of Appeals judge. Next slide. So here are the gray board witnesses. So here we got the security hearings. It's called the Gray Board because Gordon Gray chaired it. Uh, the defense, it's interesting to see the people who stood up for, who stood up for Oppenheimer. Uh, Mervyn Kelly was a, uh, an industrialist chairman of the uh, General Electric Corporation, of course, General Groves. John Lansdale had been his uh, head of security I think that's right. Fermi, Robbie, Beta, James Kona, Vannevar Bush, uh, people who stood up for him who had distinguished academic and government careers prior to this time. Terry Winnie, let's see if I've got him. For some reason, his name, the, his connotation escapes me. Um, Charles Lauritsen, um, well-known Charlie Lauritsen, everyone called him. Um, Caltech physicist, Robert Bacher, David Lilienthal, whom uh, Oppenheimer went way back with Lilienthal, had, was the first head of the Tennessee Valley Authority. John von Neumann, the very famous mathematician, a Hungarian of the same school and generation of migration that Edward Teller was. Gordon Dean, Lee Dubridge, George Kennan, an interesting case because he was, a, um, he was a diplomat. He had been the first, I think, uh, ambassador to Soviet Russia. He was an expert on Russia and in his later years was known for developing the strategy of the Cold War. Of course, R. Norris Bradbury was there. Uh, Hartley Rowe. I haven't written it down, I've sort of forgotten. And Kitty Oppenheimer, who's 
who really stood up stoutly for her husband, if you read the proceedings. Now, in what I call a prosecution, there's um, Wendell Latimer, who had, uh, oh, he was one of the people who developed in the public forum some of the opposition and passed on, um, well, developed in, by means of press articles and things. General Roscoe Wilson, who was uh, the only Air Force general to appear, he had, he had been a, an old friend of Oppenheimer's and in the early days <coughs> had helped pick Los Alamos as the site for the development of the Manhattan Project. He was ordered to appear. He might not have appeared otherwise. Kenneth Pitzer, um, a Berkeley physicist, not physicist, chemist. Edward Teller, uh, who, and I'll talk about John J. McCloy, who had been commissioner to Germany, among other things. David Griggs, who had been the chief Air Force scientist. Louis Alvarez, well-known physicist. Uh, Boris Pash, who had basically been the head of security at Los Alamos during the war. William Borden, a very important figure because he had been a chief staff member of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy and had collected, as he had a right to do, FBI reports, all kinds of FBI reports, and concluded in his own mind that Oppenheimer was probably a spy for the Soviet Union. And it was he, his sort of spreading this material and getting it into public, uh, basically into publication in Fortune magazine that really precipitated, finally precipitated the, uh, the opposition to Oppenheimer finally felt that they had enough strength to go on and, and, uh, and, and uh, try Oppenheimer. Okay, so those were the prosecution and defense. Uh, next. So here's Edward Teller. He, um, as you can see, he's in the theory. He had been uh, associate director in, in the World War II Los Alamos. He, in the course of all this controversy, he actually uh, got his own laboratory at Livermore. He had had professorships at Washington U and St. Louis, University of Chicago, UC Davis, and he was until he died a fellow of the Hoover Institute in uh, Stanford. Next. An important science defense witness was I.I. Robbie, who was actually on the AEC General Advisory Committee. He's a Nobel um, physicist, professor of, of at Columbia World War II radar, Los Alamos participant, general advisory committee. We can thank him for nuclear magnetic resonance that looked inside our, looks inside our bodies. He's the one who discovered it all. Next. Okay, a portion of Teller's testimony the testimony takes pages and pages and pages, but a, a um, crucial one was, you see, Teller was the only physicist of, of comparable stature to those who appeared to defend Oppenheimer. He was the only one who came out on the other side at these hearings and this, he, he stated his Objection very carefully, in a, and I'll read it verbatim. In a number of cases, I've seen Dr. Oppenheimer act, and this is a quote, I understand that Dr. Oppenheimer acted in a way which for me was exceedingly hard to understand. 
I thoroughly disagreed with him on a number, that's to put it mildly, in a number of issues, and his actions, frankly, appeared to me confused and complicated. To this extent, I feel that I would like to see the vital interests of this country in hands that I understand better and therefore trust more. Next slide. So here's Robbie's testimony. Robbie was a stout defender of Oppenheimer. And his testimony was like this. It's, he said, I never hid my opinion from Mr. Straws that I thought this whole proceeding was the most unfortunate one, that the suspension of clearance to Dr. Oppenheimer was a very unfortunate thing and should not have been done. In other words, there he was. He was a consultant. And if you don't want to consult the guy, you don't consult him, period. There is a real positive record the way I expressed it to a friend of mine. We have the A-bomb and a whole series of other things. And what more do you want, mermaids? <laughs> Next slide. So the majority, majority opinion of the Gray Board, the Gray Board found against Oppenheimer two to one. The majority opinion we find Dr. Oppenheimer's continuing conduct and association has reflected serious disregards for requirements of the security system. We have found a susceptibility to influence which could have serious implications for the security interests of the country. We find his conduct in the hydrogen bomb program sufficiently disturbing as to raise a doubt as to whether, and you can read the rest, would clearly be consistent. We have regretfully concluded that Dr. Oppenheimer has been less than candid, it's an interesting phrase, which I might touch on later, in several instances in his community, in his testimony, and it was uh, submitted by Gray and Morgan. And then we have the dissent, the dissenting opinion, the next one, of uh, Ward Evans, and uh, he, uh, you can, sir, I will, well, first he was in favor. It, it was because of his intellectual prominence and influence over scientific people and not because subversive tendencies that he may have influenced people not to work on the bomb. I perfectly personally think that our failure to clear Dr. Oppenheimer will be a black mark on the escutcheon of our country. Uh, and he, he, his witnesses, <laughs> considerable segment of the scientific background of the nation, as you just saw, I'm worried that, it, uh, that nuclear, nuclear physics will be retarded by all this. Uh, I would like very much regret any action to retard this. He says, I would like to add my opinion written before the bulletin of atomic scientists concerning the opera, et cetera. I suggest that Dr. Oppenheimer's clearance be restored, Ward Evans. He was supposed to be the hanging judge. So we'll go on. So next, of course, Note the date, June 29, 54. This is after the um, Great Commission reported. And there was a, a time there when, in particular, we at Los Alamos read the Great Commission report and, and got heated up about it, as did a lot of the country. Uh, James Ress in the New York Times, Stuart and Joseph Alsop, and most of the um, Many of the columnists and people in in the country, I should have that, in the country, um, were outraged by all this. And um, so, at any rate, after a while, the commission had passed on to it by Nichols, Kenneth Nichols, the AEC general manager, 
the um, findings of the Great Commission, then they went into their own session to determine what their conclusion would be. And here's the, uh, the commission decide by vote of four to one, there was one dissent again, that Dr. Oppenheimer should be denied access to restricted material. And it was Straws, Murray, Zucker, and Campbell voted to deny. And uh, Smythe, who was on the commission, um, uh, support Dr. Dr. Uh, Smythe was the one who voted to continue access, in other words, to acquit Oppenheimer. And he, I'll go on to the next slide. Next slide. Here's a picture of the uh, AEC at that time. Left to right, Murray, Suckert, Campbell, uh, and the and there's Louis Strauss, the chairman. Louis Strauss, I haven't given much biography about him. Um, he had uh, grown up during the, he entered public service during the Hoover administration. He was a Wall Street, I, I guess you could say tycoon, a self-made man. Uh, and uh, he came in to the, uh, Eisenhower administration as chairman of the AEC, Atomic Energy Commission, which is what we all worked for here in the old days. Next slide. So the majority finding says on the basis of the record before us comprising transcript and hearings of the Gray Board, as well as reports of FBI and military intelligence, it's very in interesting that they say that because they use not only the findings of the Gray Board, but their own findings of, from the FBI and military, and military <coughs> intelligence. Um, Oppenheimer is not entitled to the continued confidence of the government and his commission, this commission, because of proof of fundamental defects in his character. Now they, uh, well, let's go to the next slide. Now that's essentially what they said. They didn't, they, they were sort of careful. They, defects of his character presumably covered the Elton Chevalier affair and opposing the age bomb and all those things. But they chose simply to say, well, based on the findings of the Great Commission and what the FBI and military intelligence are telling us, uh, this is what we conclude. Henry Smythe, he wrote the famous Smythe Report, which described nearly everything about atomic weapons directly after the war. He was a professor he was a professor uh, at Princeton. And uh, as you can see, and he was the first uh, chairman or ambassador to the Atomic Energy Co Agency in Vienna, started it. And John Manley went over the, to be his deputy. But it was his descent in the Oppenheimer case that earned him a place in history. Next slide. And his descent, um, he says, the, the most important allegation of the general manager's letter, now this was Nichols' letter, which was forwarded, supposed to forward the Great Commission findings, which it did, but he added a considerable amount to it on his own in going to the, to the AEC. So he says the most important allegation of the general manager's letter of December 23, 
related to Dr. Oppenheimer's conduct in the so-called H-bomb program. I'm not surprised to find that the evidence does not support these allegations in any way. The history of Dr. Oppenheimer's contributions to development of nuclear weapon stand untarnished. And I conclude that it will not endanger the uh, defense. I prefer the positive statement that Dr. Oppenheimer's future employment will continue to strengthen the United States. Next slide. So, the, uh, I want to, I have a slide later about this, but I want to just remind you of the sequence of events. Um, Nichols informed Oppenheimer of his clearance suspension in October 23 of 53. The gray board findings were in May 6, 54. And they got out. They were supposed to remain secret, but they got out. And we saw the big, everyone here cared to read the 900-page uh, document. The letter from Nichols, well, that's later on. Um, and the AEC decision was actually on 629, about seven weeks after the gray board findings. Okay, next slide. So the Los Alamos, uh, of course, that shook people up here. And the staff response, the bullets here are letter and petition to President Eisenhower, responses from Straw's AEC Commission in Congress, visit to, uh, by Chairman Straw's to Los Alamos. Next slide. So, um, the Los Alamos uh, petition was circulated. Mine was the first signature on the petition. Uh, 474, it later became a few more. And this was, uh, that got into the local paper here. Next slide. This gave this signatory. Hill scientist Lash AEC decision. There is David uh, Hill, who was a sort of liberal activist, uh, and I think it mentions me. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through all this. It just simply gives a flavor of what was happening then. Next. So here is a letter from me. I was just a young whippersnapper, wasn't group leader or anything. Uh, and uh, I got agitated and decided to circulate a petition in the lab to protest uh, this action by the uh, Gray Board. And I wrote a letter to uh, President Eisenhower from my house on 41st Street. And it says, and you can see, at that point, I was in a hurry to get it out. 282 people had signed it. And I sent him a telegram and copy of the statement are being sent to members of the Atomic Energy Commission. Representative w, w. Sterling Cole, chairman of the Dent. And it was, in fact, all, all sent to them. I said the petition with signatures is in my possession. It's now in the possession of the Los Alamos archives. Next slide. So here is a letter from Nichols, who was a general manager, uh, simply acknowledging it. And at that point, it was 281. Next slide. And then here's a list of the signatures. What we said in the petitions, we the undersigned uh, are deeply disturbed by the recommendations of the AEC Special Security Board concerning the fitness of Dr. J. R. Oppenheimer to continue in government service. The board has found Dr. Oppenheimer to be a loyal. Remember, we didn't have the AEC decision at this point. 
to be a um, loyal and discreet citizen, et cetera, the nature of the argument by which the majority of the board nevertheless concluded he is a security risk is alarming. For example, the new requirements of enthusiastic conformity has no place in an American personnel security system. We feel that a man can give no better proof of his devotion to the security of our country than has Dr. Oppenheimer by his record over the past 12 years. We agree that it is a prerogative government to choose its own advisors, but it is inexcusable to employ the personnel security system as a means of dispensing with the services of a loyal but unwanted consultant. And then, uh, well, as scientists engaged in the defense effort, et cetera, we are prints, uh, will make it increasingly difficult to. So here we go with, I have picked out a few uh, of the names out of the many who sort of struck me. That, uh, there's my name. Uh, many of you will recognize old friends here. It's practically all of the working laboratory. I, here's Louis Rose and Frederick Rhinus, who later, you may recall, got the Nobel Prize for work he did out of Los Alamos to first discover the neutrino. My old boss, Jim Kuhn. Uh, you can see them, Harold Argo, good Richard, Dick Toshek, Elizabeth Graves. Uh, many of you who are old enough will recognize <laughs> old friends, Keith Boyer, Bill Dickinson, uh, Joe Perry. Next slide. Just go down. You can see the little arrows, Don McMillan, uh, Harlow, Frank Harlow, who famous for developing so many nuclear um, uh, numerical techniques, George Bell. Go on down, here's Frank Dunn. These are people pretty well up in the lab. Uh, George Cowan, many of you know him. He's still around. He's about to publish his memoirs. He started the Los Alamos National Bank. Next. Uh, Ed Hamill, Greg Dash. These were people involved in uh, starting the cryogenic, uh, in doing the cryogenics effort here. Uh, Bill Stratton happened to be a family friend of ours. Roger Lazarus, still alive and kicking. Ted Taylor, Raymer Schreiber, very important in the laboratory. Al Pechek, for instance. Foster Evans, Bob Thorne, who essentially started the ski area and was a, a weapons theorist. Harris Mayer, who is a weapons theorist. The two Rosenbluths, Marshall Rosenbluth and his wife. Rosenbluth was here at the time. Stein Metropolis, were, uh, you know, as you know, uh, numerical theorists. Harold Agnew, Bergen, Jerry Sudam, George Bell, Carson Mark, who is head of theory, Ben Carlson, who is head of computation. And next slide. Uh, Harry Hoyt, he, who sort of ran the place in a business then. Duncan McDougall, important division leader. Clyde Cowan, I mentioned him because he and Rhinus together uh, did the neutrino work that got the Nobel Prize. Herman Herlin, some of you may remember him. Uh, and uh, Al Graves, of course, who, the husband of Diz Graves, who was the man who was behind uh, Louis Sloten at the famous criticality accident. He, I had written him directly too. And uh, the, next, uh, the next slide is a better statement of what Straws had to say. Uh, 
And he was responding to the concern that had been expressed by the scientists. And, uh, and he said, any matter that is dis deeply disturbing the personnel of La Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, that was LASL as it was called in those days, uh, we are keenly aware of the importance, does not believe that any government service Senator Stern-Jr. should slant his advice or temper his professional opinion because of apprehension that such advice or opinion might be unpopular now or in the future. We certainly do not want yes men. Uh, and uh, he said, neither in the deliberations of the full committee nor in the review of the Gray Board was important to attach to the opinions of Dr. Oppenheimer as they bore on the 1949 within the government on, on whether, the, whether the government, sh you can read it, should proceed with thermonuclear weapons. In this debate, Op Dr. Oppenheimer was, of course, entitled to his opinion. Now, in fact, the whole thing was more or less about that. Um, anyway, it was signed by Strong. Next slide. And that, that, what you just read was published in the paper. Next slide. We're almost at the end. Uh, Strauss came to Los Alamos in July 16 of 54. And he talked, I, I happened to be at a small gathering where he uh, made a few remarks. He talked informally and candidly, and he was really laying his hair down a bit. The great report, <laughs> a rambling document meant to achieve anonymity, disclaimed the Murray discussion. Murray had a separate discussion. Um, New Garrison, Garrison, of course, was the defense lawyer from Institute for Advanced Study Board, had read the columns by Drew Pearson and the Alsops, which showed a single source out to get him, Straws, <coughs> said he had no particular education in science, but had known Lauritsen and supported his third generator, Vanegraaff machine. Cancer research stressed that he had nothing personal against Oppie. Next slide. I, I give you the sequence of events here, which I referred to. In October of 53, the blank wall, the gray board findings. In May, the letter from me to Eisenhower in June, the letter, well, Nichols' letter back in June 21, the AE decision, AEC decision in June 29. So you see, we did actually get our licks in, such as they were, between the gray board findings and the AEC decision. And then there is a Strauss letter to Reby in uh, the thing that I read and went into in some detail in July 54 next. Uh, in the aftermath, here's the Fermi Award by President Johnson to Oppenheimer. Here he is. Oh, there are two blank slides. Let's keep going. There we go. There's a picture of Oppenheimer receiving the award. It's actually the uh, John Kennedy had selected Oppenheimer, and of course he was killed. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> Johnson took over, and so they gave him the, f I think it was the fair first Fermi Award. And it came 10 years after Oppenheimer was subjected to the painful security decisions. And uh, next slide. Hans Bede, who, of course, was one of the favorable witnesses for Oppenheimer, wrote his obituary in the, uh, in the, uh, I don't, it was, it was written in the uh, National Academy of Science, for the National Academy of Sciences. 
And, um, but he wrote it to, he had scant mention of all this controversy, to, as a, as a friend and colleague, to, and you see when Oppenheimer died, uh, he said Oppenheimer, more than any other man, he was responsible for raising American theoretical physics from a provincial adjunct of Europe to world leadership. Just uh, talking about what Oppenheimer accomplished scientifically. Next slide. Okay, the references are here. Uh, the three primary recent references, of course, this well-known book that got the Pulitzer Prize, uh, American Prometheus, it's a complete biography of Oppenheimer from beginning to end. In particular, I got a lot of the material for this lecture out of this book. Uh, Janet Conant, 109 East Palace, covers much the same ground, but in a more folksy, interesting way that many people in Los Alamos would love. Next. Uh, Patricia McMillan, The Ruin of J. Robert Oppenheimer and the Birth of Modern Arms Race, covers the same ground, but in a, a deeper way. She had excess, see this was written in 2005, she had a lot of access to secret FBI files from the Freedom of Information Act. She's a professional historian, or was. Um, then the Harry S. Yes, Truman, et cetera. And then my own things uh, that are in the Los Alamos archives. Next slide. That may be it. No. Oh, yeah. A bit about the Los Alamos J. Robert Oppenheimer Committee uh, here in Los Alamos. In 2006 7, the, the committee agreed to active plaintiff for a review of the 54 proceedings by, by the law, now by the law firm of Arnold and Porter. The fir firm reported its findings in 2007 8. Um, the findings, uh, it was a long brief. It basically said, well, look, it's been a long time. We see no legal recourse right now. They did mention that a, um, a particularly actionable thing was the transmission by, the official transmission by Nichols, the general manager of the Gray Board findings to the AEC, which, uh, which was distorted and added new material so that if the AEC hadn't actually known all that was going on, they would have gotten a different impression of the, of the Gray Board's findings. But of course, everyone knew what was going on in those upper levels. Since 2008, oh, so the, the firm said that, that if it were not so late in the game, that very thing of Nichols would have been an actionable Re legal reason to overturn the finding. Since 2008, the committee has continued to pursue the matter of clearing Oppenheimer's name. A copy of the Arnold and Porter findings is available through the Oppenheimer committee. I think that's the last slide. That's the talk. I'd be questions. happy to take any questions or hear comment. Yeah. Stand up and talk loud. What were the conditions that actually convinced Eisenhower to declare to order this wall to be built? What were the conditions that uh, caused President Eisenhower to create this wall? Uh, this matter is dealt with in all these books. 
particularly Priscilla McMillan's book. Um, he was presented largely through the uh, offices of Louis Strauss, his advisor on matters atomic, um, with this derogatory information and, uh, and essentially all a, a brief on what was going to be presented at the security hearings, and that's why he did it. Just a point of information, you had 474 signatures on that petition. What percentage of that was, of, was that of the scientists at the lab? What percentage of the scientists at the lab were the 474 signatures? You know, I was asked that question once before. Uh, I gave essentially the same talk inside the lab uh, a, year or two, a year or so ago. And I think we concluded, counting up the numbers, it was about 40% of the working staff and probably a larger fraction of the scientifically involved staff. So there were many scientists whose names were not on the list, and the question is, had they, were they given the chance to sign, and did they decline? Well, they weren't on site. They weren't here. Uh, this was circulated among the groups, group secretaries all over the lab, and whoever was actually here it was signed it. People. Yeah, the on-site people. Was, was there any common theme amongst those who did, chose not to sign, and what were some of the circumstances there? I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, whether some people were politically disinclined because uh, they were on the other side of the argument, no doubt there were some. Um, but I simply don't know. I know who signed. And uh, I don't exactly know who didn't sign. <laughs> Perhaps it relates to that last question. Uh, McCarthy and his red scare and, and uh, his uh, chasing down of anybody who had anything to do with uh, left-leaning politics, that was already eminent in the American mind at that time, right? I imagine some people were scared of this whole scene of uh, Senator McCarthy and his searching out of them. It, it, am I right in saying that that, that was part of the, all this momentum that preceded? Did the audience hear that? Okay. McCarthyism. Of course, this is right in the middle of the McCarthy thing. Uh, McCarthy was riding high. Um, that is to say, the senator from Wisconsin was head of the House on American Activities Committee, I think it was, and he, um, he was, quote, ferreting out communists in the State Department, the Army, and everything else. If you read the uh, books, particularly Priscilla McMillan's book, uh, he got wind of Oppenheimer and this is documented in these books, and wanted to go after him. Um, but according to the, this literature, he was told by these, the people in the government who, who were going to be involved in this really getting, going after Oppenheimer in this proceedings, don't do it, 
essentially, we want the guy, don't do it. But it's certainly true that all during this time, the, Oppen, the so-called Oppenheimer era, which history dis by now is described, it was going on. And people here who had security clearances um, naturally had some reason to be apprehensive in that climate about uh, speaking up. And the fact that they spoke up and the thing just gathered momentum meant that they didn't care. Practically simultaneous. <laughs> and uh, that was the one where this wonderful old lawyer for the army, defending the army, finally said to uh, McCarthy, Sir, have you no shame? <laughs> and that sort of ended the thing. Were there any re repercussions for those of you that signed the petition? No, there were not. As you can see from the tone of Straws's comments in the letters to me and when he came, the last thing he wanted to do was to encourage any repercussions because he was trying to prove, although it wasn't true, that this kind of repercussions had been what had brought the charges against Oppenheimer. I, I wanted to ask about um, Jeremy and, no, I mean Teller. Teller, where was Teller? When did he leave the lab? And can you say more about his whole personal attitude about this? Because I thought he was extremely antagonistic and kind of led the whole assault in a way, but I could be wrong about that. So asking for more information, more background about Taylor at this time. Yeah, I have tried to, in this whole presentation, to present an objective uh, summary of the facts. Um, if you read the three books, um, particularly the, the Bird Sherwin book or the Macmillan book, you see that there was an awful lot going on and that Teller uh, was in, in fact, uh, he, had a, he could walk in the Pentagon anytime he wanted to. He was very much involved with the Air Force who had a lot to do with, with pursuing this matter because they, they wanted all the bombs they could get hold of. Um, and Teller was very closely involved with Straws, saw him all the time, had ready access to uh, uh, Eisenhower. So the, the historical record shows through these books that Teller, uh, Teller was very much opposed to Oppenheimer, in fact, carried out a, a lot of activity in against him in the government. Um, is there anything about Bradbury's reaction to your, to the letter, to the signature? There was, Bradbury uh, didn't react to it. In fact, I doubt if it even went to his, to him. I think, of course, he, he was, he testified in defense of Oppenheimer and he is well known to be an Oppenheimer man, of course. Um, but I never heard any reaction from him about this matter. Okay, one more question. I'm sorry, I just wanted a follow up. It seems to me that all of this went on between Teller to develop the hydrogen bomb and it was only tested, it's never been used. And how many times was it actually tested? 
Oh, m many, many times. I, I mentioned three tests there, but oh, some of you who have more of a hundreds, hundreds of times. Uh, why? We we blew away more islands in the why? <laughs> in the atolls. Fred, thank you very much for coming this evening and for all the research you've done. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of me is the very last remaining M Historical Society mug. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Los Alamos Historical Society! <laughs>